Today I want to talk about ADSB and remote ID for drones. This is probably terms that you've heard before and maybe you looked at those and you're like, I have no idea what this means. So the intent of this video is to basically uh, teach you about ADSB and remote ID, how they are similar, how they are used in the drone industry, how they may be used in the drone industry. There's a lot of unknowns still with these two pieces of technology. So. The first thing that I want to do is I want to go over and talk about what the technology actually is. And then I'm going to go over and talk about who uses it. And then I'm going to talk about specifically for drone pilots, how is it going to help us drone pilots with, well, you'll see lots of information in here. And then also what can we expect in the future from the FAA and from different drone manufacturers and from different uh, providers of services in the drone industry. So the first thing is, what is ADSB? And ADSB is, stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Now, that tells you everything, right? Well, not really. This really is a technology that was designed without drones in mind in the first place. This is something that the FAA has been working on for a long time for, uh, drone, for, for uh, manned aircraft pilots. And it's a technology that you'll find in maybe the aircraft that you fly on a commercial flight, or maybe the small aircraft at a flight school will have ADSB technology. Now, with that being said, this technology allows the aircraft that are participating in the technology in the ADSB to share the altitude and to share their position with other aircraft and with air traffic controllers. Now, this is a great idea. This is a great concept where everybody who's flying in the airspace is going to tell everybody else where they are, at what altitude, in what location, and in what direction they're going. So this is great information that you want to have as a pilot, as a manned aircraft pilot. There's two pieces to it, two components. The first one is called ADSB out. And as you can imagine, ADSB out broadcast your information to other aircraft and also to a ground station. I'm going to show you a diagram in a second of how everything interacts in, in, the, in the world in here. Now, ADSB out is mandatory, will be mandatory for manned pilots, for manned aircraft that are going to be flying in certain parts of the controlled airspace by January 1st of 2020. Okay, January 1st of 2020. The other piece of the puzzle, the other piece of the technology is called ADSBN. And then with ADSBN, basically what happens is that the uh, information that is broadcasted by ADSB out is being received by the aircraft or by the controller and then being displayed uh, in some kind of fashion. Now, ADSB in is not mandatory as of 2020. You only need to be uh, able to broadcast the information. Now, obviously, if you're a user, if you're a pilot, you want to have this piece of information available in your aircraft. The reason it's not in is not mandatory is because it requires an additional display or, or, or um, um, uh, a device on board the airplane that will allow to display that information. Newer airplanes are uh, able to provide that information, older airplanes not so much without adding equipment. So the, the FAA only made ADSB out mandatory by 2020. Now you're going to say, what does that really look like in terms of the airspace? Well, let's take a look at um, different components in here and, and how this actually works out. We have a small airplane, we have a large airplane in here. The next component that we have is the satellite and we'll see in a minute what the satellite is uh, role is into all of this. And then we have a new component kind of, which is the ADSB ground station. Now let's take a look at the relationship. This airplane here is ADSB out only, as a lot of smaller airplane will be in the future which is the mandatory equipment. Now, larger airplane like this commercial flight right here is going to be ADSB in and ADSB out at the same time, which means that they will have the ability to broadcast their information, but also receive information from other places. Now, the way that this is going to work is that the location of the airplane itself, the position of the aircraft is going to be broadcasted, is going to be um, determined based on GPS technology. Now, this is not a new technology. You've heard of GPS before. This is how the aircraft's position is going to be uh, determined and, and, and how we're going to be able to encode this information and send it to everybody else. From here, the ADSB out airplane is going to send that information to the ground station. That means our small airplane here is going to be sending that information to the ground station. But also our large airplane here is also going to be sending that information to the ground station. And also what happens is between airplanes in flight, the ADSB out airplane will be broadcasting that information to anybody that wants to receive it, aka aircraft that have ADSB in 
installed. So that small airplane broadcasting the information directly to the ADS-B in equipment on board of the large airplane, and then that large airplane will be able to see it without having to use the ground station. And also what happens is that the ground station is gonna be able to provide information and send it to our large airplane um, and, and send that, that signal uh, so that the large airplane can receive it in with the ADS-B in technology. One of the catch with the ADS-B at this stage is that it is not required in all airspace. Now remember, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, some of the presentations I've made about airspace, uh, controlled airspace, uncontrolled airspace. In this case, ADS-B is required in controlled airspace, which means class Bravo airspace, Charlie, Delta. These are the, the, the bigger um, airspace around airport. And then also in class E airspace, starting at 10,000 feet MSL. Now, there's another little rule over the Gulf of Mexico, you have to have ADS-B. I'm not gonna worry too much about this. The big picture is above 10,000 feet MSL in class E, and then anywhere else in class B, C, or D, and then above it. Now, for you as a drone pilot, what does that mean? We don't fly at 10,000 feet, right? We fly at 400 feet. So in our case, aircraft equipped with ADS-B can be found, in most cases, will, will be found 100% sure in controlled airspace in B, C, and D under 400 feet. In class E airspace, it could be, they could be equipped with, with uh, ADS-B or they could not because it is not required, okay? Now this is gonna be important in a second when I talk about one of the pitfall of ADS-B. Now in terms of ADS-B for manned aircraft, in concept, ADS-B N, which is the ability for us unmanned aircraft pilots to receive that information is great. This is great information that we can be using. It provides very critical information that uh, we can use to prevent a collision, for example. The interesting part about this is that DJI has actually vouched to equip all of their aircraft, all of their drones by 2020 with the AirSense technology. Now their AirSense technology is the equivalent of the ADS-B N. It will be receiving information from the ADS-B uh, towers and broadcasting that information to uh, drone pilots, which is great. I think this is a great technology. Now, ADS-B out has been ruled out by the FAA as a viable solution because it's basically going to clutter the display of uh, manned aircraft pilots. Imagine having hundreds of maybe even thousands of small aircraft just popping on the screen. Now, some say this could be filtered out. I think uh, this is actually a good idea to keep it out and have a kind of a separate technology, but time will tell. I've thought about this for a while, and I think some of the pitfalls for ADS-B for UAS are as follows. First off, this assumes that all of the manned aircraft are gonna be equipped with ADS-B, which is not the case. We saw that there's no requirement for ADS-B in class E airspace below 10,000 feet MSL, which is a large part of the country. Class E airspace, it's, it's basically everything outside of airports. And class G obviously is not even included in this, which is also a big part of where drone pilots are gonna fly. So what this means is that really, um, we shouldn't expect to get uh, traffic information for all the aircraft flying where we are gonna be flying under 400 feet. Also what this means is that you may have this installed in your software with DJI and then you say, well, I don't need to pay attention because it's gonna pop up on my screen, right? Because everybody's gonna have it installed. Well, incorrect, because as we saw, it is not the case. And this is basically an over-reliance on the technology, which is something that's dangerous, which uh, is, is something well-known in the world of main aviation. And this can lead to two different things, which first one is the decrease in situational awareness, you knowing what is going on around you. And as you know, drone pilots have to give way to um, other uh, manned aircraft in the airspace. So this is very important to not lose that situational awareness. And then the other thing too is it could lead to people taking more risk because they think that they have data available. Well, I can't see around the corner. Uh, I'm sure if anybody is coming around then it's gonna be displayed on my screen. Then that leads to accident because we were too reliant on a technology that in the first place was not really designed for us um, for, for this purpose. So. It's a great idea, it's a great additional tool, it's not a tool that we should be relying on 100%. Now let's talk about remote ID. Now remote ID is a, is a different concept and it's, it's a concept of a system that is used to identify drones that are operating in the national airspace, airspace system. 
Now, with that being said, this is kind of like a, a digital license plate for your drone. As you're flying the drone, someone, we'll talk about who someone is, will be able to see what, um, who's flying and, and the purpose for the flight, kind of. This is born from the fact that operators are not going to be located in the same place as the aircraft in itself. You're here on the ground and you're flying possibly miles away from where the remote control is located, where the pilot is located. So we need to be able to identify the two and make sure that whoever, uh, whoever's aircraft is flying, we know who it belongs to and we know what the purpose of the flight is. I've taken this data from Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk is what we call a USS, which is a, a service provider that provides lands a request, for example, and they've spent a lot of time trying to educate people on the concept of remote ID. They have a white paper that I recommend that you download. I'm going to have a link in the description. And they came up with these two little graphs right here, which I think are great to explain uh, the concept of remote ID, because that's all it is at this stage. It still is a concept and how it could be implemented. There's basically two school of thoughts. The first one is called broadcast. And this is um, a situation where the drone in itself would be broadcasting the information to whoever has a receiver that is authorized to receive the information. This could be law enforcement. This could be another receiver like, uh, like the DJI uh, Go app, for example, if you're flying your drone and you could see that information on there. This could be the control tower. So the idea is the, the drone is broadcasting the information to whoever can receive it. The other concept is called a network concept, and this is a little bit different in the approach in the sense that the, the signal is not being sent from the drone like it is in the broadcast model. The information here would be going to the controller, and the controller in most cases is going to have a, a cell phone. And this is working on the fact that the cell phone is going to be broadcasting that information to the cloud using uh, some kind of internet connection. And then from there, that information is going to be broadcasted to whoever can receive it. So two different concepts. There's pros and cons, and there's a reason why there's still cons concept is because there is still obstacles that need to be uh, met before we can uh, move forward with this. And one of them actually is the FA. We'll talk about it in a minute. Now, let's take a look at side by side the broadcast and then the network and take a look at, at a few more details about how, about how this possibly can work. The first idea with the broadcast is that this is a one direction only. The drone is sending the information to whoever is receiving it. There's no specific uh, destination of no specific recipients in this case. And then the other thing too in this concept is that uh, this information could be sent from a drone to a station on the ground. Now this would be ADSB-like. The FAA has already said that there will be uh, no data through ADSB with remote ID, so they will not be sharing the same thing. So this would require a, a, a different network, a different set of towers, which um, can be costly, obviously, and who's going to pay for that is one of the questions. Now this could be also troublesome to broadcast that information over a long distance. So the drone in itself trying to send that information over to the ground. This also means special equipment on board of the drone to do this, which, um, which would mean uh, to have that equipment installed to older drones that don't have the technology. In the other concept with the network concept, the first thing is the data is sent to the internet uh, with a service like a smartphone, for example. And in this case, what would happen is that a provider, a USS, it's a service supplier uh, like US Sidekick or Kitty Hawk or AirMap would basically act as a third party, as a middleman to provide that information. Now, the downside with this approach is that we still don't really know what the USS um, end result is going to be. Uh, are they going to be asking money to do this? Is this going to be a free service? So a lot of people are still afraid with the suppliers like AirMap and Kitty Hawk. And, and what is going to happen is um, is there going to be a, a pay to play scenario, which uh, some people are completely against, including myself. Um, this is not something that we need to go towards. The FA has decided to hire a third party to deal with this. This is not how it is being done in the manned aircraft world. So there's a lot of red flags in this case with this happening. This is just my opinion, but um, we'll, we'll see how this pans out. 
There are several benefits. There's actually about four benefits to the remote ID. And the first one is that it allows for uh, having advanced operation. And by advanced operation, what I mean is flying over people, flying belong, uh, beyond line of sight, a visual line of sight, which is kind of a big deal, and flying at night. And all these things right now are happening with a waiver, but this kind of, of system, remote ID, would allow operators to fly under these conditions without having um, all these waivers and, and having all kinds of advanced uh, approval. This is critical for things like package delivery, for example, where a beyond line of sight is gonna have to happen, where flying over uh, cities, for example, is gonna have to happen. This is critical for that piece of the puzzle. Also, this can be used for more transparency to the general public. And this is kind of the, the people that are trying to push remote ID um, are trying to say that by having this information available to the public, then people will be more comfortable because they'll look up in the sky and be able to see that, hey, this is an Amazon drone that's doing a delivery or this is Joe Blow that's doing a flight locally and this has been approved. Once people get access to that information, then likely they will not be questioning what the drone is doing and it just uh, makes drones more mainstream. I'm still on the fence about this argument and I'll talk about it in a second when I talk about the cons. Uh, of this happening. Another benefit to Remote ID is the fact that this can be used to gather safety data and then help create better policies in the future. And I agree with this point. At this stage, we do not have any kind of system that allows us to collect data and allows us to see if people are actually operating dangerously or if they're actually following the rules. Now, we all know that there's a bunch of people that just want to do whatever they want to do. But this would actually help us to uh, determine if people are being safe flying the drones or not. And if we actually need more regulation or if we need less regulation or different regulation because the data is showing something different. So this is a great way to collect data and actually use it for a good purpose, which is to create better policies, less policies possibly in the future. And this kind of leads to the last one, which is the fact that this would limit over-regulation of the industry and, and also a way to better enforce the current regulation that we have in place. We all know that the FAA is far behind um, on enforcing the current regulation, and, um, and this could actually be a way to help with this. So the people that are actually flying and following the rules wouldn't be troubled with this kind of system. On the flip side of the coin, there's a few arguments or counter arguments, I should say. The first one is that, that I'm going to present to you is does the general public need to know who's flying and where they are going? At this stage, if you see an airplane flying in the sky, are you going to question where that airplane is going and why it's going? Do you see a car driving uh, in your neighborhood? Do you want to know who's driving it and where they're going? So in this case, one of the, uh, the counter argument to this is, does the general public really need to have access to that information? And also, when the general public has access to that information, what are they going to do with it? And, and could that lead to more harassment of pilots that are actually following the rules and, um, and operating safely and legally in the first place? So these, again, are question, unanswered questions, but we got to think about that. And the last point with this, the other side of the coin, is how are we going to implement this for, for example, remote control aircraft? Um, the majority of the flights before quadcopters came around were just people flying at a field and flying a small uh, airplane with a remote control, which does not have a cell phone, which doesn't have anything in the controller that allows to send that information. So how do we retrofit this without additional equipment, without additional burden on all these operators that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, without any trouble? So we have kind of two sides of the industry. We have the drone, the, the commercial operators, and then we have the hobbyists, and, and their interests are completely different. So how do we reconcile the two by having a technology that works for both? So to finish, where are we at with this technology at the moment? This is recorded in early June of 2019. And remote ID basically at this stage is stuck at the FAA level for approval. And as of May 2019, there was a, a symposium with the FAA and they've kind of 
uh, push the uh, approval down the road. So we don't really know when it's going to be approved, if it's going to be approved, quite frankly, uh, what form it's going to look like. So we're still kind of waiting to find out what remote ID is going to be. Now, one thing that we know is that uh, there are several USS that have uh, tested a version of remote ID, their own version of remote ID. Uh, the manufacturers have done that too. DJI actually has at the moment in DJI Go 4, you can go and there's a little remote ID section where you can um, decide to do it voluntarily. Um, I know Kitty Hawk has worked on uh, a concept that involves other USS providers so that the information from other people can be shared in their app, in their system. Uh, which I think is, is a great idea. We do need this to be global if this is what's going to happen. And also I'll finish with this by saying that the FAA has gone on, on record in saying, and this is from the uh, acting administrator at the moment, he said, without remote ID, the US industry will not advance and beyond the uh, visual line of sight flights over people flying at night will not happen. And the industry needs to realize that this is kind of uh, the, 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 the blocking the block at this stage that's gonna prevent all this from happening more widely. So these are the sources that I used. You can go on the FAA website to look at the ADSB. There's a lot of good information in there, including coverage for your area. And then there's a lot of good information on the Kitty Hawk website about remote ID for commercial pilots. They have a white paper that you can download. It's about 15 pages. Um, a lot of the information I, I use today comes from this source. And then AirSense is the technology from DJI that uses uh, ADSB. And you can see that video right here on YouTube. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And as always, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I have more videos coming up in the future about different technology, about what's going on in the industry, about part 107, about hobbyists. So if you want to get notified, please go ahead and subscribe. All right, see you guys later.